So here, let me just introduce myself really briefly, and we'll get to um, uh, what we want to talk about. Um, so here we go. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, so so really, um, uh, first of all, I just want to say that you know, we're based on the East Coast, so you might not know us. So we're a little group that tends to work with the great big ones and um, brilliant experience. I, I founded in 2011. Um, I'm a former psychology professor and uh, went to um, do usability kind of things and gradually um, moved more into um, sort of UX research and strategy. So, so we actually here, I think I have, I really was gonna give you two slides and about, 20 seconds and then move on to what we're doing. But I just wanted to give you a sense that we're, we know I can count my folks on my hands and we're, we're working on moving on to toes um, to let you know we're gonna try to, we're, we should have a new senior um, UX um, role that we're, we'll be offering to a couple folks um, coming up this week. So you can follow along on brilliantexperience.com if you're interested or you know folks who might be. Um, and here, let me keep us going. So I just wanted to say that the things that I do the most and that Brilliant Experience does the most are sort of three things. We really try to understand customers and the psychology behind what they're thinking. And that's exactly what we want to talk about today. We also help to do things like, um, well, if there are these interesting possibilities, what's the scale there? What's the competition like? Or where might we fit best in our strategy? And so that's number two. And the third is just, well, gosh, you know, John and team, you know our users better than we do. What should that thing look like? And so we help to do early prototyping and concepting. So all these things around product discovery. Okay, that is all of the information you're going to get. And, and let's go on to what we want to talk about. So I, I wanted to just um, give you a sense of um, uh, some of the things I wrote in my book. And... Um, I, I want to say just how did this book come about briefly? So I gave a talk at South by Southwest and I had all these cool people like the head of innovation at Lufthansa and stuff say, oh, that was really neat. That's cool that you do that stuff. Boy, I wish I had a psychology PhD too so I could do it. And the answer is no, you really, really don't have to. So in the book, I've got three sections. One is, is this is a little preview of number one, which is really just what are the pieces to um, uh, in my specialty is actually cognitive psychology. So, so one of the, what are some of the pieces there that are really helpful for everyone? Um, number two is if you are interviewing users or watching them work, what should you be looking for, how to do that? And, and you don't need a fancy psychology PhD to do so. And thirdly, if you get that interesting data, what do you do with it? And that's, that's the third part of the book. So I just wanted to give you the feeling. And so I think I might hit a little more of the like problem solving decision making side of the world and some other books are really good at the sort of perception and attention kind of side of the world so just to to give you a feel uh, but there are lots of really good um uh books out there in this and i'm happy to discuss that too um okay cool well let's let's move forward um so oh, wait, actually we have a quick question from um tiziana who wants to know if your font is hobo <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've, I, I know it's not, but I can't remember um, which one it is. So um, we actually, we just switched some of our look and feel. And so uh, uh, Oh, not the font for UXPA. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll let it go for now. Um, but uh, Oh, oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you like it. Okay, good. Well, we we're trying something a little different. Um, cool. It is actually, these are, there's Google fonts and then there's an add-on to Google fonts that lets you get all of the Google fonts, not just the ones that normally come with Google slides, just out of curiosity. So that's what we do. So we get more options. Okay. But I want to, you know, it's a, enough of me talking. Let's get you to do some of the work here. So, you know, you all, uh, probably a vast majority of you work in user experience. So, you must obviously know what user experience is. So, so I guess the question is, what is user experience? So, so um, you can go ahead and, and just type that in because I'm sure the answer is obvious to you being an expert in user experience. So, so go ahead and find that chat and, and what, what is user experience? Or what is the user experience? Yeah. Yeah. 
And by the way, this is the answer I get every single time, like silence at first. And so, so thank you. Um, okay, creating a wonderful experience for the customer that meets business goals at the same time. Okay, well, well done. Let's see. Um, so actually, uh, there we go. We, we were talking, uh, Melanie, about who, who was first to answer. So you can maybe capture that. Um, uh, let's see, people's interactions with your product or service or how people interact with the product you've got, the sum of the experience with a brand or product or service. Okay, that's interesting. Um, uh, you know, the other thing is we're really not all answering the, the, the thing the same way, just to note. Um, it's one challenge with us trying to work with all the business folks. And they're like, what do you guys do again? Um, uh, okay, a holistic view of the product or service that you're delivering, as well as what's happening around the user. Okay, or a journey, uh, the perception of the product. Okay, these are good. Okay, I got it. Um, so let's just, let's go for a concrete example here to, to keep us moving. So um, here I've got... Um, uh, oh, by the way, I, I, okay, if you know exactly what this thing is, I do not want you to write it in the chat. But for those of you who don't know exactly what, what thing this is, can you name what I have on the screen right now, this picture? So again, I don't want the like, if you know this is from this date with this designer, don't want to know that name and spoil it. I want to know from the people who don't know that what they call this. Okay, a chair and a leg rest. <laughs> the most expensive chair in existence. Okay, you're not miles off. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, a mid-century classic. Okay, interesting. And, and, and then in some ways that doesn't really describe what we're seeing. That could be a table or something else. Um, Okay, so it could be an ottoman and a, okay, so some people, okay, recliner, okay. A way to relax, interesting, okay, good. Um, okay, so so now I need to put you in a situation since you are, we're talking about a therapist chair, nice. Um, uh, so I'm gonna sort of immerse you in a, in a situation. And so let's say that you were going to go to uh, e-commerce, you actually go to an e-commerce e site and you want to buy this chair. So um, just just keep, you're doing great in the in the chat. Let's just keep this going. So what would be some of the, what do you imagine you're going to do at this site? What would be some of the steps that you would do at this, at this site, do you think, from wanting to buy it to buy? You can just shout them out, just type them in there. Okay, you might search for the chair. You might browse. Okay, uh, look at the features. That makes sense. Look for the chair category. Nice. Okay, I think these are all the right kinds of things. Um, right, and if you don't know its name. Okay, let's assume we don't know its name. Thank you for that note, Paul. Um, check the dimension, search the cost. Okay, these are all good. So let's give this a try. Okay, so we're going to... Okay, so... Oh, look at the chair, decide if you like it. Do you need it or not? Oh, we're not going to talk about need here. We need it, yeah. Um, check the price. I'm sure price is no object for any of you, but um, <laughs> buy it at the counter. Okay, well, well, let's assume that we're actually doing this virtually rather than in person. Okay, so you, these are all good. So here, let, let's, let's go ahead and try to put this into practice. Okay, so let's suppose this is the website you get to, and there is this store called Design Within Reach. And they're a, they're a very cost efficient site. No, not really. But um, uh, so take, I don't know if you can, I, I can read these off for you if it's a little hard to read, but they, they have things like um, new living, dining, bedroom, workplace, outdoor, storage, lighting, rugs, uh, designer, sale, accessories. So um, uh, let, design out of reach, outside of reach. Yeah, fair enough. So which of these categories do you think the thing you were looking at would want would be in? Okay, so you're all you're all heading towards living. Um uh, right, <laughs> praying that it's in sale. Nice. <laughs> That's excellent. Um okay. So now um yeah, clearance. Yeah, I wish that too. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and just pretend we clicked on living, 
And so this clarifies it really well because it's got like classics on sale and living room collection, um, sofas, sleepers, lounge chairs, ottoman, accent, storage, view all. So um, first of all, was anyone expecting those categories? Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, imagine that you may not think of exactly those categories. Um, so we wanted that object that we saw earlier, and I'm trying not to name it. Um, what do you think you would click within living here to try and find this thing? Okay, I got one vote for lounge chairs. Okay, lounge. Okay. So I'm going to get you all very comfortable in this talk. We're all we're going to be lounging on our thing. Okay, okay. View all sounds like another successful thing to to aim for. Okay, so let's just assume. Let's, so let's say we clicked around and we actually find the thing. Okay, so um, so let me go there, and here it is. It's the uh, and I, I actually have this in presentation mode. It's a little smaller for me, but the low low Kmart price of um, seven thousand two hundred ninety five dollars as a maximum, and um, so, you know. Is this, uh, so you're seeing something here. And so what what does it look like you do to like, like I want this, what, what, what are the steps you do? Okay, so you select a size, standard or tall. Okay, colors, <laughs> right, your home equity line of credit. <laughs> Excellent, I appreciate the humor. And um, and so let's just say that this is, the, I, I wanted exactly the model that showed up, thank goodness. Um, how do I, how do I say I want, I like go, put this in my cart? Where, where, where do you do that? Right, so it's not, first of all, it's not obvious. Uh, it only got this excellent. Um, yeah, so it, it actually is below the fold, but maybe that's not the, I, I understand people scroll, but um, it's still, you know, it's not as obvious as it could possibly be. So we, we found, first of all, that, you know, the living categories were a little unusual. The homepage had all this funky stuff on it. And so there was a lots of, of pieces here that you had to think about. You had to think about the navigation, the words, what you were expecting versus what it was giving you. Um, and here, let's just keep going a little bit. So, um, you know, let, let, right. So there's there's these obstacles here, I, I would agree. Um, so it's in stock and actually the good news, the configuration you want is less than the maximum. It's only $6,595. So really, you know, why just get one when you're there? So, um, so before you hit the add to cart or the buy button, is there anything that um, like what are you thinking right now? If if you if you just put that one down on the credit card, what what uh, um, I, what what kind of emotions are you feeling right now? Okay, can I split the payment? Okay, okay. Do they ship to me as a Canadian? Buyers <laughs> somewhere. So okay, okay. So like emotions about oh my god, is this the right choice? Um, what what is the tax and the shipping? Um, and uh, so I've had a couple people say something like, "Oh, um, well, what if they? Okay, anticipation and excitement. Okay, delivery time. Okay, not clear. Um, you know, another thing that someone said is, "Wow, what if they the and they? I believe the word they used was dudes." Um, get, uh, bring the thing out and they unwrap it. And just as they're about to put it in my house, they scratch it. What happened? So like, yeah, the return policy. Um, someone else was like, man, that thing looks big. Would it even fit in my space? What are the dimensions? Um, and right. Will I feel about the, how will I feel about this tomorrow? So you can see there's lots of things you're thinking about. And someone else was like, yeah. And how do I explain this to my significant other? Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like uh, when you, when those like sell your boss on the conference. Um, okay. And someone else is still back on, should it really be the white leather or the brown leather? I don't know. Um, and how fast can I get it here? Right. We need it. We need it here tonight. Um, okay, great. Uh, so you can see that there are lots of pieces you were all thinking about. And so uh, what I'd like to suggest is, um, right, <laughs> excellent family trip to Disneyland. Well done. 
um, uh, I what I'd like to argue is that you were look you had things that were drawing your attention. We were thinking about language. We were thinking about our expectations and past e-commerce sites. We were thinking about our emotions with this um, and like how to make this decision and what comes up and, and the emotions associated with that. How do I navigate around the site? So I guess I'm trying to say that we often talk about the user experience and I'm gonna suggest that it's it's actually not the user experience. And uh, um, so, and, and yeah, actually in a virtual world, I'd wanna see this thing in or, you know, person. So I, I really wanna say that there isn't a user experience. I'd like to say that UX is really something that has lots of dimensions and lots of modalities, like um, what you're drawing your attention and, and what you're hearing, what you're feeling. So especially sitting on this thing, how would I feel in all those dimensions? Okay, great. So, so let's dive into that a little bit. And so in my book, I talk about, and, and you know, this is a, a simp, so for all of you psychologists, just bear with me. Um, this really was a sort of um, simplification, but I, I wanted to give you a sense of what are the dimensions of, of um, you know, your thinking that we want to consider and capture and, and build into our decisions about should this product exist, what form should it have, how, you know, and so on. So really, um, and what I'd like to do is take you through these over time. So there's um, uh, obviously just language. So there, there are huge differences in if I'm an expert versus non-expert in the language I'd want to have presented to me and so on. Um, there's all the things you're doing to try to make a decision and what information do I need when in different decision points. There's obviously you all had lots of emotion about this thing and might have to sleep on it and not have the... Uh, apartment anymore, your house, just up the chair. So um, so what is there that's, that's some of the larger drivers to your decision or behavior? And um, number four is wayfinding. So this is something we don't often think about, but our parietal lobes are huge. And so how we know a, a fair bit of how people and even down to rats or things that fly navigate, but how do we navigate the virtual world? And that's a, an interesting challenge that I think deserves plenty of new dissert dissertations. Um, also just what's attracting our attention and ultimately like where's Waldo, what are they looking for and why? And also really thinking about how they frame the idea. So what are some of those past experiences and how are they categorizing information and so on? Okay, so let's take a look at these in turn. And thank you all very much for diving into that and really, really leaping in. That was perfect, please keep it up. So, um, so let's just talk about these six different, you know, I, I, I just call it the six minds to give it a, a simple name. And so um, let's start with things like vision and attention. And, and a piece of this is automaticity. So first of all, I, I, this is a, a tough one for you. I want you to be ready. Okay, so we, we, um, we primarily have two visual pathways. So we've got the one that's heading up to your parietal lobes here. And that's all about uh, where something is, the rate of speed of something, um, those kind of, so basically like putting things in space essentially. Um, and that's our, and the other is our what pathway. So that's literally where you start with just um, typically a sort of black and white representation, identify edges, identify which edges go together, and then try to connect that to the other stuff pieces of dimensions of these things and start to recognize objects in space and so on. Um, oh, and just, um, I don't mean to derail us too much, but yes, I, I would like to share my slides with you. So um, I think we'll have a PDF along with the recording actually coming up. Um, so um, here, let, ooh, look at that, I'm drawing. Okay, oh no, here, one sec. Can I go back? Yes. Okay, let's get ready here. Um, so I want you to think about what you're doing here, and I want you to give you the problem of which is a chihuahua and which is a muffin. Okay, here we go. I by the way, thank you to Twitter for having these things show up. Um, I think these things are awesome. So um, anyway, uh, hopefully you're you're enjoying this this image, and uh, I don't have. Uh, I think it's great. So yes, I would love for you to share this with other people. So I'll leave this slide up actually while I pose my question. So how do you think, I believe that you're pretty good at, at deciding which ones are chihuahuas and which ones are muffins. 
Um, but what do you think you did, like in with your cognitive processes and stuff? What 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 do you think? What what helps you to make that decision? Okay, so Joel is saying. Okay, so I think uh, there could be chihuahuas named often. True, I know. I can't help you with that. Uh, so Joel said, look for a pattern. I think you're one of the first. Uh, look for animal characteristics. Okay, like nostrils, maybe that those two maybe go together. Um, Okay, someone says you're using your memory archive. Okay, but you you probably never met these specific chihuahuas, so it might be a generality you're thinking about here. Um, okay, look for for context. So it might it might really mess you up if there's a muffin wrapper in uh, a chihuahua in a muffin wrapper or a muffin in a dog collar, but you're assuming those won't tend to go together. Uh, look for a snout or a fuzziness. Okay. Muffins are organic. Well, I, I would tend to argue that dogs are very organic too, but okay. Um, uh, look for eyeballs. Okay. And it's interesting, like what to find an eyeball, you know, that's tough, right? Um, Cause they're all kind of shiny round things that are about the same color, right? Does it figure, trigger a food craving? Okay. I'm not going to touch that one, Adam. Thank you. But I appreciate the thought. Um, looking for symmetry. Uh, right. You, you, you're hoping there aren't as many, it's not, the muffins are not as hairy as the chihuahuas, okay. Um, oh, okay, we've got a, some science here. Okay, ratio of distance between eyes and nose and mouth, okay. So, right, some of those things have more than four black, or sorry, three black things, and so that's unlikely to be a chihuahua and more likely to be a muffin. It's got the wrong configuration. Okay, so you've got lots of ideas. Okay, so let me keep us moving. This is great, thank you. Um, so, and, and Melanie, honestly, we're just, we've got so many people, you can just go ahead and, and pick some of our, our um, respondents. Um, and it's cool of me. Um, uh, okay, let's see if I can advance the slides here. Okay, so we, we, you've got lots of possibilities here. And I just wanted to say that if you don't know about like visual science, you're probably just, you know, so our term would be confabulating, but you're kind of making stuff up. And so the point here I actually wanted to say is you really don't have control over this process. And there are lots of things like this. So this is fun and it's, you know, fun to check out. Um, but um, uh, there are so many things that you don't have conscious awareness of um, and many others. And so one challenge for us is, as user experience people or psychologists is, hmm, how do I... Uh, how do I draw out of people things that are automatic and you don't really have conscious awareness of? Um, so so uh, we'll talk about that in a sec, but I just wanted to say like, watch yourself when you wake up in the morning tomorrow and you go to maybe, I don't know, brush your teeth, get a drink of water, whatever. Um, the way you navigate to the bathroom, which you probably do lots of times, um, is probably so automatic, you didn't even realize you're doing it. So I uh, just one representative example of all the things we do that are sort of built in. Yeah, someone said it, call it muscle memory. And, you know, it really is sort of brain memory, but it's not your conscious, it's a little bit like playing piano. It's like, you're not really thinking about it as hard. Okay, so let, let's, let's keep going. Um, so just a little bit about the wear system as well. So um, I just want to give you a feel here. So again, we're just going to play a little game and I'll keep us moving after this because I'll have to pick up my pace a little bit. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a picture, okay, of a website, an old website, mercifully a website that doesn't exist anymore. However, um, uh, you're going to look for these three word patterns. You're going to look for news topics, McCain, and Soviet, okay? So see if you can see any of those three in this. So if you see, say, McCain, I'll get you to type it into the chat, okay? Um, so, or if you see news topics, write that into the chat, okay? And the good news is, if you can't see anything, you can just type in one of these words and I'll never know. So, so you know, it's a little bit of an honor system, but, you know, don't feel bad. Everyone can participate no matter what. So we're looking for news topics, McCain, and Soviet. Here we go. Okay, I know, really small front, I know. Oh, well done, okay. 
or someone typed in McCain's, that's a French fry brand in Canada. Um, Soviet, okay. Let's see, did anyone find news topics? Okay, so I would argue that it's not the easiest thing to find here, right? And by the way, this is called havenworks.com. I do not want you to type that into your browser because last time I checked, it tried to get you to download a, a virus. So let's just not do that. Um, okay, good. So lots of you found McCain pretty quickly, um, but you can tell that one of the things that you should know is um, if you hold out your um, two thumbs at arm's length, and my thumbs look very big relative to my head right now, but um, uh, that's about two degrees of visual angle. And that's about where you have really good acuity. And beyond that, you really don't. So I'll get you to actually, after this talk, walk over to a bookshelf, look at one book, and try to keep your eyes on that one book and try to read one two away. And you can't. So your, yeah, it's, it's your foveal view. Well done. Yeah. So, um, wow, give that guy a book. Um, and so, um, uh, what I want you to know is that you, you actually feel like everything here is perfectly clear when in fact your whole brain is playing tricks on you and really whatever you're looking at is clear, but really beyond that gets the, the your ability to represent color gets degraded and your representation of, of acuity obviously drops way, way, way off. So I, I just wanted to, uh, to let you know that, that that's one of the things that's a challenge. And you might be like, well, it was hard to find those words on this, but if it was well-designed, like I'm a designer, it would be easy. Okay, um, well, challenge accepted. So let's look here um, at, uh, so one of the things we need to do is, is how do we direct people's attention to the right things on some sort of interface? Um, so that's, that's something we can talk about later, but um, okay, I'll just get you to try this one more time. So look for minimal, modern and entryway. Okay, you ready? Minimal, modern, and entryway. Okay, so if you see one of those, just type it in. So it was minimal, modern, and entryway. Okay, you're doing pretty good. Look at that. Okay. So actually, yeah, that's, we have a little, we, wait, uh, this is a, um, chart. So it seems like minimal and modern were the first ones to hit you and then entryway a little, little longer uh, away. Um, I actually, I can't remember where entryway is anymore. Um, interesting. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. And the menu. Uh, it's right there in the center. Yeah, it's interesting, right? So even though this is, you know, well-designed and got white space and calm, it still takes a fair bit of effort to find, you found these things, but it still took a fair bit of effort. So I just wanted to say, it's not just because that last site was a horrible monstrosity of a web design. It's literally just, you You do have to scan around to find things. So it just reminds you how to how minimal your, your design should be ideally to make it optimal. Um, okay, good. Well, let, let's, let's move on. So we've talked a little bit about, uh, what things are. We've talked a little bit about like navigating and finding things and automaticity. So I just, in summary, um, I just want to say that, um, when you're drawing your attention to somewhere and, and processing things visually, it is, um, it is a mixture of your conscious goals. Like you were looking for those specific words and sort of automatic processes. So lots of you might have looked at the picture first just because it drew your eye. It had different colors and different um, uh, contra visual contrast, things like that, that might draw people's attention. Um, so you really need to know what are your customers or your design, be it internal or external, looking for, and what is drawing their attention. So, so we really, so sometimes we go to the level of eye trackers and things like that. Um, but uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, this is what happens when UX pro projects are siloed. Uh, it makes sense because you're the one working on this versus the whole. Yes, I think that's a good point. So it is, that's exactly why we get outside people to test things at our target audience. And so um, 
yeah, this is one piece. So, so now that we've done one, let's keep going. And this is actually, I know you all were waiting for this story, so let's go ahead and tell it. So I want to talk about wayfinding, and this is your parietal lobe. It's one of the biggest areas in your brain. And I think us as designers really underutilize this, this power. So this is where if you're, uh, lots of us have been to universities where there's like a horrible um, navigation from these like nameless, faceless buildings. You have to remember to turn left here and turn right there and go down the stairs. Um, that's that's using your parietal lobes, that, that sort of location-based uh, system. Okay, um, and wait, we'd call that wayfinding. Okay, so, and, and my daughter would be panicked because she's like, you mean without Google Maps? I'm like, right, without Google, without Google Maps. Um, so now I'll finally, I know you were all expecting it, so let's have a story about ants in the Tunisian desert. Um, so, and I've got a reason for this. Let me let me bring you to it as fast as I can. So moral of the story is there are um, Tunisian ants happen to be very big, so they're easy to follow. And um, if you're in the Tunisian desert, remember there, there just wouldn't be, there's a couple challenges, right? So you as a Tunisian desert ant don't have trees to, to point to. And actually, the, the contours of the sand might really change with wind, right? So there's almost nothing really there that can you can use as a cue, maybe the sun. And so um, what these experimenters did is they, they followed. So just say this is one ant, and every five seconds, they put a dot down. So this ant came out of the nest, and he kind of you know went, what is that, sort of southwest, and then turned around and started going northeast and like puttering around, left, right, you know, zipping around, makes another sort of U-turn. And what the experimenters did is they put something like equivalent of a bird feeder down with a bunch of, you know, a little, a little bowl of honey, right? So the ant finds the honey in the bird feeder and is like, oh my God, this is the best pay dirt I've ever seen in my whole little ant life. And so what they what the experimenter did is pick them up and move them like eight feet to the right, okay, and put the thing back down. And what does the Tunisian ant say? Like, holy crap, I got to tell all my friends. So what this ant does is goes, and I, and I would use the words beeline, and I, it's a pretty bad dad pun to say a ant line, but basically it makes a direct aim back to where his home would have been. He's not really designed to be transported in this bird feeder eight feet, so he kind of messes that part up. But otherwise, this is a good representation of he knows about what direction home is. And then if you're an ant in the desert, you just start doing circles around to try to find your home because there's no really good markers and they don't have a like welcome home mat. So um, so that's what they do. So they're, clearly this thing is computing Euclidean space, knew how fast he was going in what directions and could recompute where home is. It's really amazing, right? You too, despite not feeling like you do, have this property. So the question is, how do we harness this power we have in our brains for what we do? So it's a, I don't think I have a super great answer for you, but I want to recognize that there's this is actually your, your representation of distance and of um, time duration and uh, light intensity, um, sound tones. All these things are using a comparable system with the same precisions and so on. Uh, new uh, quantity. Um, is another one. So anyway, just uh, there's your fun-filled fact. Um, so I want you to think about how you do this in physical space and then think about virtual space. So, um, uh, and here I'll, I'll, I'll go to questions in just a sec. I'll, I'll give you one more story here. So, uh, so I've got a, a daughter who actually today graduated from high school. How about that? But she came home one day, I don't know, but uh, uh, was that maybe five six years ago, and um, was just, and she's a pretty mild mannered person, and she was like stomping, and oh so mad, and just like furious, and we're like what happened? You know, did someone like bully someone? Did like someone get hit by a car? What happened? And they're like, Snapchat changed their navigation. And so I don't know if you remember, but the CEO of Snapchat decided, hey, let's make this more friendly to like old timers like John. And so what they did is they blew apart her mental navigation system of how this thing works. And so it was a 
really a debacle. It was on the news and gradually they unwound it because she had built up this mental representation of space and how one navigates it. So I very much want um, folks to think about how your users have started to intuit how they navigate their virtual world and what cues you give them to let them know you're on this page or that page or how to get back or, or even you're now in this modality. Um, so, okay, someone says uh, Google is the worst. So yeah, there, there's no shortage of examples here that are, are suboptimal. Um, but anyway, I, I want you to, to just um, recognize this. This is most extreme here because there is no navigation. Or, you know, you just notice swipe left or right or things like that. So, um, but people have learned it. And so you want to be really careful about breaking their mental expectations. This is not just true of a mobile app. It's really of anything. Like we were just talking about how a um, uh, uh, like e-commerce site works. And um, I remember the first time I went into a restaurant here in Washington, DC, where you order online. And then when your order is ready, just this, this huge wall of, of uh, what um, uh, sort of white glass panels, one of them just lights up and you look for your number and that's when your meal is ready and you get it from that little cubby. And um, it was so breaking my expectations of how this thing works, right? So, so a piece of this is both navigation and another one is expectations being met. So, uh, uh, okay, so someone said, hey, should we start giving maps of screen flows just like we have in documentation uh, for enterprise software? <coughs> the challenge there is that it, feels and your representation is so nonverbal, right, of, of space. So I'm not sure if I have, and actually to your point, Joel, there, um, I would argue this is a great like master's rep, you know, or some sort of, it, it's, it's a question waiting to be answered. So, um, uh, and yeah, onboarding is another thing there where it's like, how do I even know how to find what cues are out there? Uh, and, you know, from apps and stuff, sometimes they have the like, hover things that show up and everyone just X's those out as fast as they can. And even though they might be helpful. Um, so it's a challenge actually, but I, I just wanted to recognize it. Um, and I just wanted to say something slightly different. When we did stuff for Gen Z over at, at Google, it was really fascinating to see. This is actually a, a published paper because I couldn't give you the stuff we actually did, but um, this was uh, directions in videos of something you're supposed to do. So I think the upper panel is, or I think they're actually both origami now that I think about it. Um, but we heard people totally want in video to be able to say, hey, slow down or show me that again, or okay, I've got that step. Can you skip to the next step? So we were doing things like um, uh, makeup or uh, gaming. And so people want to know like, what does it look like when I'm done or now go back to where it was? So I just, these are examples where that's, in human, that's how we speak or how we're thinking as opposed to how the technology is working. So we want to get as close as we can to what's the human mental representation and think about it that way. Okay, so I just wanted to say with navigation in space and navigation in time, there are these really interesting opportunities for all of us. So I, I'm as much acknowledging that opportunity as I am telling you what to do here. Um, so, okay, let's keep going. Um, so just the bottom line here is that there's so much of our brain devoted to navigation and physical space. And so how do we harness that and really understand how cust where customers think they are in virtual space and how do they think they can move around in that virtual space? So it's a real, it's an interesting problem. And I think there's so much opportunity for us. So I'm just, I'm, I'm dropping it for you. Um, in Montreal, there's spray paint that says uh, too many causes without a rebel. And this is one of them. And I really encourage you to, to go for it and try to figure this out for me. And by all means, share it with everyone. Um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Someone mentioned actually um, the structure of information for screen readers and how people go at super fast speeds. I don't know about you, but when I, when I have uh, interviews now and I play them back, I it, I can't stand it on one speed. I want it on like, um, I, I don't even use um, the stand. I usually download it from something like Dscout so I can move it faster than double speed. Yeah, it's, people really get good at, at um, taking in information at a really high speed. Um, okay, cool. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about semantics and memory. Uh, and and it, oh, yeah. real quickly, it looks like Joel um, raised his hand. I'm not sure if he meant to do that, but Joel, oh. if you have a question, do you mind just chat, um, typing it in the chat for now? Cool. Yeah, no, no, I can, I can take it, take a break here just for a sec. Absolutely. I want you to, to follow along. Okay. We're going to see well, how if fast. You're going to pause. I'll just, I'll just uh, unmute real quick and say, I'm just curious to know if sure. uh, there is like a clear correlation between how people navigate in virtual space and physical space, or do we do that differently? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, so first of all, the answer is it's highly unstudied. So, so I think the best answer is we don't know yet. Um, and so I, I, unfortunately, I can't give you much except that this needs to be looked at. Um, certainly we do grasp at the tools we have that are existing. So you start to, um, a little bit like, I think I mentioned uh, how you navigate to go brush your teeth in the morning where you're kind of doing that on autopilot. Um, that same system is the one we tend to use for these, you know, apps are a good example where you have to swipe or shake it or whatever. Um, and you start to learn those things automatically. So um, I don't know, I, I, I tr on an iPhone, for example, I am like, oh yeah, I can't find that app on the home screen. So I'm going to like swipe, swipe, twist, and get to the big list of the apps. And I've just, I don't have to say that to myself anymore. It just kind of happens. And so it moves from this um, attention-based um, focused energy to automatic things. And so that's why when you break <laughs> the old pattern, it really breaks people's things. They have to jump from using their automatic process fails. Then they have to switch to attention and be like, what happened? Where am I? I'm not where I was expecting. So it's like doubly paying, paying attention to the things you didn't want to talk to attend to. So I guess it's actually watching the, maybe my best advice is watching how people have automatized their behavior. Um, you know, is is a good a good example. There's a great book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. is from one of my old um, experimental psychologists um, uh, who writes really well. And um, anyway, that that has it really nails the concept of there's this really focused, attention based, conscious thinking that goes slow versus your really automatic like reading. Reading it just just kind of happens. You're not like memory at this point. You're like memory semantics, abstracting away the detail. And so, um, seeing that automaticity, you know, switch from attention based to automatic, and what's happening there is is one piece to that puzzle. Uh, but no, nope, I don't have a good. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, yeah, Kahneman, thank you. Um, okay, cool. Well, here let me let me actually. Um, take you on. Thank you, Joel. And, and I'm sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer, but I would love for someone to give the answer um, over time or for us to keep thinking about that. Um, so with memory and semantics, let me, let me um, jump to this. Uh, and um, what I want to say is that we go so quickly from surface level representations to abstracting away all the detail. And so I'm just going to give you some examples here. And, and for those of you who are moderators, don't worry, the last bits go faster than the first bits. But um, uh, first of all, you know, you've seen probably maybe even thousands of these things in your lifetime. So this is going to be pretty trivial for you. So if you, if you go for like, let's say we go for columns and rows. So if I did like C1, R1, that's column one, row one. And that's what I think the real penny is. So I don't want you to go rifling through your couch looking for one of these. I just want you to go by memory because you know this so well. So what? which is the real um, penny here? So you do like column whatever, row whatever. You can just type it in the chat. <laughs> I like D3. Oh, oh, D3. Oh, okay. I see. I see the... Um, one C, okay. Um, right, so, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, some of my colleagues who are, are shiny new, I, you know, I'm like, how often have they touched money, you know? Um, but uh, I think the key point is what we know is not actually the exact photographic 
instance of something, we know the generality and the abstraction behind this. So that's why you're all just debating here, right? So we've got like many different answers. It looks like in general, column one, row three is popular. Um, I kind of think it's actually the one that's mere reversed from that. I think it's column four, row two. Um, so anyway, I, I even I'm not completely positive myself, but um, I think the biggest point is that um, we collectively, we're a bunch of smart people here and we don't know the answer. And so that's telling, right? So we know the notion of a penny, the abstraction, the concept, but we don't know the exact physical or we can't consciously pull out the exact things. We just need to know this relative to the other currency things. Like, is this a, a euro or is this a dime? And so anyway, um, my point is that this is just a good example of an, we abstract away the from the surface details. Um, okay. And so here's, um, you know, if I said this is like, you know, upper left is uh, number one, the upper right is number two, lower left is number three, and lower right is number four. So it goes one, two, three, four. Um, which one is the real letter G? I love it. Okay, we got one, two. Anyone for, okay, I've got column two, row two. So that's probably number four. <laughs> it depends on the font, okay left one at the bottom. Good. Okay. So we have officially got one ant vote for every single one of these. Okay. This one I actually know. So the correct answer is on the upper right. Um, and it's a little different than how we write it in handwriting, but we actually recognize it appropriately when it's in context. So I just wanted to say that, um, uh, you know, this is just another example of you've seen a lot of these and, um, you know, we're all struggling, right? Um, it does depend on the font, no, no doubt. But um, I want to say that this is another example of something you've seen lots of that you can read, and yet you consciously can't pull out which exact is, is exactly the one. Okay, let's keep going. You know, I have this here for the slides, and we won't be able to do this today, but I'll get you some time to draw this picture. And so... Um, what I'll get you, so let me just set this up. So how I want you to do this. So get your rectangle, right? So go find it. So we won't do this right at this moment, but you'll you'll make a rectangle or you'll get your friend to make a rectangle. Then you'll show them this image just for, you know, a few 10, 15 seconds tops. Then you're going to take it away and ask them to draw the picture. Okay. And so what happens when people do that? I'm sorry, I've got to go the right direction is that they tend, you can see here in the actual image that, now I'm gonna give away the secrets here for you. So you might wanna do this with your friend, your spouse, your colleague. Um, and so here you can see the points of the um, picket fence aren't visible. The right side of the garbage can isn't visible. The bottom of this lid is not visible. So what people tend to draw is something a lot like the one in the lower left here, um, where they show the entirety of the fence and like maybe the bottom of this lid. And you don't know what's there. Um, but again, you're abstracting away. There was like a garbage can and a lid and another garbage can and a fence. And so we, we imagine what's beyond those things. And so when you, um, yeah, so someone's mentioning closure. Um, so it's a sensible hypothesis, but it really could be that there are little um, stars on top of all the fence things there, um, or uh, uh, some sort of figurine, or there's a giant tree, or a person staring at you. You don't know. And so I guess my, my point is that we make an inference based on the examples we know of from the past. And it makes perfect sense if you're looking at something through a cardboard tube that you're going to you know imagine the rest of the object is there. Um, it's not an unreasonable assumption. It's just something that you assume automatically. So I just wanted to say that we go so quickly from surface details of what's there to the actual thing, um, to, to a representation of the thing, that it, we're unaware of that and it happens all the time. So this is just a, a representative example where I want you to say like, 
if you're like, hey, I want, maybe we should go to a bar for happy hour. Well, one person might be thinking of a place with like spray paint on the walls and everyone's just got, um, you know, a bottle of beer. Other people might be thinking a place that's got like cool glowing neon and like fancy drinks with like umbrellas. And so my point is, what is the abstraction that's in those people's heads and helping you with your products and services and, and understanding the anticipations have people have of not just physical objects, but like of um, services or of steps that might be taken. So what's, so for example, I was completely surprised when we got to that um, store that had the glowing uh, frosted panel glass to get your food, you know, because it did, wasn't part of my expectations. So we want to know, yeah, what lived experiences they have and interpretations they have. And just knowing that, yes, the mental model people have. Thank you. Um, that's exactly what I was thinking. Very cool. Okay. Um, so I just want to say we really, when I say rapidly, I'm like within seconds, um, move from a perceptual representation to an abstract and prototypical one, like, like a prototypical fence, a prototypical garbage can, but it could be a prototypical restaurant or prototypical restaurant service in a fancy restaurant and so on. So what is your customer's abstract representation of what you do? So like search and, and filtering or um, any number of things. That's why some of the chat things are, are confusing to people because they weren't expecting something to happen or they're trying to discover how this Alexa thing works or whatever. Um, okay, great. And yeah, cultural um, lenses are super important in this as well, where um, I remember actually, um, I was working with a, a Indian team and I promised to bring us back on track. Um, and uh, they loved it because I had, I had my little Josie was a little baby at the time. And I was like feeding her at like two in the morning and they were all up, you know, at normal, normal office hours. And I was like, oh man, I have to stop this and like go do laundry. And they type back, you do your own laundry? Like what a weirdo. And so my point is that, yeah, those cultural things are super important too. And that's a great example of like uh, my mental representation of what's typical is not theirs. Um, there was a, a tide thing they did where it's like, here's a great way to get stains out from your garage or from your um, draw room that you do art in or your um, basement. And, and, you know, for people that had flats, you know, somewhere and didn't have a garage, it was hopeless. It didn't help them at all. So same idea. Okay, great. Um, let me just give you a few more examples and I'll pause and let us talk. Um, so, um, with language, I just want to say that there are two pieces to this that I want to say is sort of take home. One is what is the language your customers are using and what does that help you understand about their level of representation of understanding of your world? And so let me give you a concrete example. So, um, you know, I might talk about home insurance or car insurance or liability insurance and the insurance broker might talk about something completely different, uh, uh, CRL. Um, I ha I'm a small business owner, so on an annual review, my insurance guy was like, hey, you know, um, what, how is your plup? And I was like, my plup? My plup? Like, don't look at my plup. How dare you bring up a plup in public? Like, I know, anyway, I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was like, I, I have something in my shirt. Like, what? Anyway, he was talking about your umbrella policy, but I had no idea that was called a plup. And so, uh, right, bring on the acronyms, exactly. So, so I think the point here is making sure you know, maybe you've got customers that work at that level and maybe you don't. And how do we, how do we tolerate that? And a beautiful example of this is from Medline. Uh, this is from um, one of the government websites. And um, you can see actually in the black titles, they've got, um, I would call it a TIA because of cognitive neuropsychology background, a transient ischemic attack, but they've also got also called a mini stroke, which is what lots of quote unquote humans, you know, average folks would say. So they've actually put together two levels of representation of ideas. So you can find what the scientists talk talking about in the reverse. And um, I, I write, and th those insurance things could cause a, a, a transient ischemic attack. I totally agree. And or a left infarct and so on. Um, okay, so there's all this jargon. And I just want you to think about the words your people are using. And so often internal folks have our internal baseball we talk about. 
and it makes no sense to external folks. So please do think about that. And secondarily, what does that say about the sophistication of their representation in their head of the problem they're trying to solve and so on? Okay, great. Um, I'm actually gonna keep moving on here from this. We just need to say, uh, so these are Canadian words. And so I just wanted to say like, are there any of these words that you recognize or you know the meaning of? Okay, Tooney, okay. Okay, some people think they know what a kerfuffle is. Right, so it's so like a skirmish, a, a fight, a toboggan. Okay, toboggan is a sled. A chook is a thing you put on your head in the cold. Okay, nice. Okay, and a soaker is exactly what you think it is. I've got boots that are so high and I step in water that's deeper, I get a soaker. Uh huh. So great for when there's melting snow. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, oh, so you don't know what pogey is in Toronto. Okay. Well, well, let me let me tell you. Um, so it's sort of an old timey term. So uh, if you uh, the the representation I've got is when folks decided they were they were in construction and they didn't really want to work over the winter months, so they'd go on unemployment insurance. They would go on the pogey. So there you go. And it's kind of it is kind of like a term from the fifties. So it's sort of. Um, not out there every day. But anyway, just the point was um, that your users might have a very different set of words they use or meanings or representations, and you want to make sure you match that. Again, this cultural awareness kind of thing. So I'm glad that all you Americans know what us Canadians are thinking. Um, no, it's okay. Just friendly teasing. Okay, uh, let's move on. So really, I'm talking about what, what do your customers use in terms of words, and what do those words mean to them? Because it could be different than your meaning. So are you using your customer's language? Okay, great. Um, so let us let me keep us going here. I just got a couple more things to mention. So um, uh, with decision making and problem solving, I just wanted to say that this is a great example, and I'll just kind of cut to the chase here. So um, in escape rooms, you know, you can't just walk out the door, it's locked, and that's got a padlock, and then you're looking for a key, and the key may be in another place, because there's a cabinet that's got the, some sort of secret code on it, and then there's some, like, numbers on the wall, maybe they're a clue, blah, 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 and so my key point here is you start to build up a problem space of here are my goals, and I have these additional sub-goals, just like you might in chess or checkers, um, and so I want you to think about how your users think they can solve a problem and what steps they think are involved. And you might really have to train them that actually the game they think they're playing essentially is not the game that they really should play. And how do you help draw people in for where they are and help them to understand they have to do other things as well? Um, so, so anyway, I just want to say that this notion of problem space is one that we tend not to use very much, but I really encourage you to think about. Um, so what is the people's representation of their starting point and their end goals, and how do they think they can get there, and what are some of the subparts? And if we know that, we can help them with different steps in the process and just giving them information they need to get to that next step, and not all the information they need and overwhelm them. Okay. Um, and so, so really, I was just trying to say, what, what do your customers think the problem is? So like uh, young folks trying to buy a home might think the problem is I have to sweet talk the owners into picking me. And actually the sophisticated folks, like the real estate people would say, well, is this a clean title and what's your FICO score? And so you might really have to help those um, potential new homeowners understand what the game really is. And, and help them understand the, the different things that they have to overcome. Okay, cool. Um, like if you're using Ariba or one of these a monster um, programs like that, um, uh, uh, the same thing. You might not know really how to solve the problem with the thing you've got. Okay, great. Um, and I was gonna mention emotion and I'll, I'll just, I know I'm a little over, so I'll, I'll just mention this. You know that when you're doing decision-making or problem solving that, you know, uh, with car negotiations with the family is a really good example where, you know, it's not always like this. Sometimes it's a little more like this. And so 
if, if you've got this screaming kid next to you, you're making simply you're simplifying the problem and just saying, what do I need to do to get out of here? Or, or you're just saying, is this about right? Okay, fine. I'll just buy it with that. And you're not saying, okay, 3% minus this plus the uh, discount for the leather seats is, you know, you're, you're doing um, what they call satisficing. You're making a simple, so that close approximation to the decision you want to make. If it's in that neighborhood, you say yes. So I just wanted to say that recognize that folks lots of times have emotions or other things that are filling up their working memory that impair their ability to make really clear, rational decisions. So know that can simplify or help them with the decision. Um, and so, so that's that's what it really what I want to say about about this piece here. Um, and uh, I, you know, uh, by the way, this is this is about a family and stuff as an example. I just want to say that lots of times we do other things. Like I had folks that were um, buying video ads on Madison Avenue, and so they had a just a business to business interface. And in that situation, the person was like, "Oh my God, I have to buy eight million dollars in ads, or I'm going to get in really big trouble." And if I don't buy the right 8 million, this is like my big chance to be on Madison Avenue and a super cool ad agency. And I could be kicked out tomorrow if I do this wrong. Oh my God. So they were like terrified to hit the buy button. And I just want to say this applies just as much to all of our daily business tools as it does to something that's very uh, consumery. So I just want you to, to make sure that um, you know that we want to track people's emotions. We want to attract, um, understand their underlying drivers. Like what's your, what are some of your biggest fears in life and what you're doing? What um, I, we did interviews for Capital One and I remember I got, there were 32 interviews. I think I got five hugs because they're like, oh, this therapy was awesome, man. And all I did is like say, what's in your wallet? And I'm like, well, what do you do on weekends? And what do you do that for? And why, what is this all about? And what do you really want to do? Where do, where do you really want to go? And suddenly they can answer simple questions and get to like things that are really inner feelings that they can share. So I do want you to get there, even on the stage of something that's like a business to business thing, it can be relevant. You know, what happens if this goes wrong for your job, for your group, you know, and so on. Um, and that can have real big influences on how their behavior. So, um, and I think you're absolutely right, Paul, that people love it when someone tries to really listen a little deeper than just like, so would you hit this button? Okay, thank you, check. And just like, well, why? What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about could go wrong and so on. Um, so it is really important to think like that. So what are these deep emotions that are being activated? And, you know, if they are making some decision, what needs to be overcome? You all with the chair, well, you know, that you were buying for $7,000 earlier or $6,000, um, maybe it's a bargain, maybe it's $5,000 something. But anyway, um, uh, you were like, what if, what's a return policy? Um, how soon is it going to get here? Um, how do, can I split the bill? Like, oh my God, there's so many things to think about. So all that was sort of your emotions kicking in. And so we want to know what those are um, and how to simplify the interface if it's really an emotional situation. We want an easy button if it's a panicky thing. Um, okay, great. So let me just show you a couple examples here. So we helped to redesign um, the business side of paypal.com which is 85% of their business. So they really wanted to get this right. And um, so just as a representative example um, for vision. So the first thing you look at is the darker part of the screen here, and it's got an interesting visual. And so and from there, you know, there's some writing on top that's sort of front and center. So businesses sell more with PayPal. And that was their signature thing they wanted to mention. Um, and, and then immediately we tell you what's on this page as well to help frame it and know where to go to things and also give them the expectation of what's to come. And then thirdly, the actual image itself doesn't look like a giant warehouse of cubicles at HP. It looks like maybe a, a little mom and pop coffee shop. And so it gives you a sense this is for small businesses and not for large enterprises. So even in this one little picture window, we tried to use vision, we tried to use activating your memory for concepts, and we try to do wayfinding. Um, so I just want to say this is very possible to use all these things as you're really working. The other half of this, I'm going to continue just down the page here a little bit and say that um, we actually won. I, I'm so happy to say this. So our, the marketing folks listened, and rather than make something the super big wowie zowie, 
they said, offer credit cards and PayPal, which is exactly the words that their customers said, I just want to be able to offer credit cards and PayPal. How do I do it? Or they said, I just want to add PayPal to my checkout because I've already got all these credit cards done. So that was really what people were saying. And they literally put on the website these two things that were the five words that users use. So no marketing speak, just like the user said. So we totally matched their language. I thought that was awesome. And that's a tough one. Um, and then I've got, you know, businesses that use PayPal sell more. And really, that was the emotional side. As we met with these small business owners, they're like, oh, yeah, if I sell this much more, I can get that deck. I can get that cool boat. We can go on that big trip. I'll be like, well, my friends will be envious. Like there was all this stuff that was wrapped into it. In addition to I'm a small business owner, and it's partly me. Um, so if I sell more, I'll be that much more successful. I'll be that much, you know, just all these things tied into that. And then if they've got this emotion, so they want to move forward with it, let's make sure we also have some like rationalizations here of why does this make sense? So both not only they're excited about it, like that person that was like, I want to get this chair as fast as I can and how excited I'm going to be to receive it. But secondarily, here's the reasons this makes sense. So if you're talking to your business partner or to yourself, you've got a, re a legit reason why this, this makes sense. So I'm just saying, Every day you can use all these components and, and try to match people's expectations, drive their memory and, and, and um, activate the appropriate parts of memory and draw their attention and so on. Um, so there you go. Um, and yes, um, actually Robin is right that emotions create memory in the sense that um, there are lots of, you know that the things that are major emotional things in your life, you remember really well and they're sort of like anchors for memory. So that's true, um, uh, but good. Um, really, that's ultimately what I wanted to say was that I wanted you to think about these six pieces to your cognition and, and emotions and experience to get to the why to deliver the best experiences you can. So there you go. That's, that's what I wanted to say. And thank you so much for sticking around for a little extra time. But I, um, and I think at this point, I'm completely happy to open up the floor, but I really want to thank you all for sticking with me and, and hearing this out. Awesome. Cool. So actually, if you have questions and so on, I'm happy to answer them. So um, actually, Jessica, do you have a question? Um, no, I just unmuted myself in case you need me to step in and moderate the question time. So yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand. And I sure. So Igor said, why are there six and not seven or five or 50? Um, so it's a good question. And what I tried to do is say, um, first of all, I want to have a practical, like tolerable level of precision that could be really put into practice for people who are not psychologists and, and for stakeholders and all the, the, the different folks. And, uh, you know, we really looked at what were the biggest drivers of behavior. And these were some of them that we, we pulled out. So um, like some people might break vision and attention out separately. I really brought them together because it really is about the visual design of something that, that draws attention and is about vision, for example. Um, but there's also attention that is non-visual, for example. So, um, okay, tons of questions. Let me try and respond to some of them.